Good evening. I'm Graham Allison, the director of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, and it's my great honor on behalf of Harvard to welcome here tonight the Secretary of Homeland Security, Jay Johnson. Uh, uh, Jay is a phenomenon, and we have a great opportunity tonight. Uh, as the Secretary of Homeland Security, he has a modest assignment. It includes responsibility for preventing terrorism, managing national borders and enforcing immigration laws, safeguarding and securing civilian government computer systems, and preparing for and coordinating national response to terrorist attacks, natural disasters, or, or, or other federal emergencies. To fulfill these responsibilities, he oversees a department that has a budget of $41 billion and about 226,000 employees. The component agencies include the Customs and Border Protection, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, the U.S. Coast Guard, TSA, the Secret Service, and the Domestic Nuclear Detection Office. Prior to his current job, Jay Johnson was general counsel for the Defense Department. And prior to that, uh, among uh, many of his firsts, was the first Afro-American partner it, to the great New York law firm, Paul Weiss. So at each stage of his life, he's done remarkable things. When appointed Secretary of Homeland Security, President Obama said about him, quote, Jay has a deep understanding of the threats and challenges facing the United States. As the Pentagon's top lawyer, which was the job he had just before this job, he helped design and implement many of the policies that have kept our country safe, including our success in dismantling the core of Al-Qaeda in the Fatah. So for discussion tonight of Homeland Security, but also of immigration, and also of terrorism, and also, and also, and also. We have a fantastic opportunity. Let's say welcome to the Secretary of Homeland Security. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? I, um, I welcome the opportunity to speak to student audiences. It's an opportunity to explain what we do, to the general public, and it's hopefully an opportunity to encourage a number of you to consider a career in public service. Those of you who are here, who are students at this great institution, may already be headed in that direction. I want to further encourage you in that direction. I uh, understand that my cabinet colleagues Ash Carter and John Kerry were here not too long ago. Now, this is Harvard, and you all are used to important visitors with security details and the like. Uh, I have two kids in college. Now, they go to smaller schools in California where they're not accustomed to security details, the United States Secret Service, for example. And I'll never forget the first time I visited my son. He was a freshman. Now, can any of you students here imagine what happens when an eight-car motorcade with marked police vehicles and chips, the motorcycles, show up at a freshman dorm unannounced? <laughs> you hear lots of toilets flush and lots of doors slam. <laughs> Eventually, somebody peeks out and says, oh, your dad is here, now I understand. Um, my daughter had a different attitude to my visits. Um, she said to me, dad, don't embarrass me. Dial it back to the bare minimum of what you need no motorcades. So I did my best to comply with my daughter's
directions. And so chips, the highway patrol, and as many of my vehicles as possible parked a block or two away. I hit the campus and I learned that day about something that everyone here is familiar with, Yik Yak. <laughs> when I hit the campus, Yik Yak lit up. Hey, there are two Secret Service agents on this campus. What up? <laughs> the Secret Service, you know, with the earplugs and everything uh, and the pullover shirts, they do not easily blend in at a small liberal arts college. Secret Service is here, what up? And there was this immediate fast and furious conversation on Yik Yak that my kids are following. So the reply, Obama must be here. <laughs> Somebody said, no, Obama's nowhere near. He is on the East Coast today. The next reply, Malia is here. She's looking at us for college. No, she's not even college age yet. So my son jumps into the conversation and he can't help but make fun of his dad. And he says, uh, no, it's a Vin Diesel look-alike <laughs> with bodyguards. And eventually somebody figured it out. Uh, it's the fake Obama. He runs Homeland Security. His daughter is a freshman here. Oh, okay. So uh, that was my experience with Yik Yak. And I, I do try my best to comply with my, my college age kids' directives when I go visit them. I like these discussions to be interactive. And so I look forward to the Q&A. As a graduate of a legal education, I very much believe in the Socratic method. You learn by answering questions without being given the right answers necessarily. There are lots of very smart people in this room. So, uh, and I have, I have a challenge coin here. Uh, these things started in the US military where commanders of military units would give these out on special occasions, but only the leader of the unit can give these out on special occasion for special accomplishments, achievements, and the like. And I have two. And I have uh, a, a political science question that I'm gonna dare somebody here to try to answer. Who knows the presidential line of succession and where I sit in it? <laughs> okay, this young man back here uh, knows the presidential line of succession. Uh, you don't need a mic, just shout it out. Yes. <laughs> Bottom line answer first, correct. I am last. And why am I last? Correct. And of course, number two is vice president. Number three is who? And who is number four? Somebody said it over here. President pro tem of the Senate, and then it proceeds. Uh, in order of the secretary's department, right? So you're right, I am last. There is nobody behind me, nobody, <laughs> except maybe the US Army. And so I take that obligation very, very seriously. I try to stay in good health. Um, <laughs> there's, no, there's, there's a huge burden on the person who was last in the line of succession. But young man, please come up, come on up. <laughs> Tell me your name. Brett. Brett? Yeah. Okay, Brett, I am coining you. you. All right? <laughs> now, if you don't have a coin, a challenge coin to give me back, yeah. you owe me a beer. Okay. I will gladly keep it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, challenge coin question number two. Part of the Department of Homeland Security includes the United States Secret Service. The United States Secret Service has been in existence since 1865. Ironically, it was created by Abraham Lincoln, an assassinated president. 
just before he was assassinated. It was created as a law enforcement agency with a bank crime mission, counterfeit currency, bank crimes, and the like. And the Secret Service still has that mission. Half of what the Secret Service does is law enforcement, financial crimes, cybersecurity these days. The Secret Service picked up the protection mission following the assassination of William McKinley in 1901. And they've had the mission to protect the President of the United States ever since. Now, who here knows who the Secret Service protects? Yes, sir. Could you, could you stand up so we can hear you? Foreign dignitaries, okay. Well, we got to start with the president, right? Okay, the president, who else? Vice president, who else? Their immediate family, you're, you're, you're cooking with gas here, keep going, all right. All of them? Really, okay. Well, before we get to the cabinet, uh, who else? Put, put, put the cabinet aside for a moment. Who else does the Secret Service protect that you know of? What's that? <laughs> presidential candidates. Certain presidential candidates, right? <laughs> right. Do they, does the Secret Service protect all presidential candidates? Every, everybody out there running for president. What do you think? Right, and who, who, who do you think has to decide among the candidates which one should get Secret Service protection? Who do you think that might fall on? Me, right, okay. So certain presidential candidates, right? And then after the nominating conventions, the vice presidential candidates, right? Okay, great, we're, we're rocking and rolling here. Okay, who else? What's that? Former presidents. Who said former presidents? <laughs> former presidents. What about former first ladies? Yes, former first ladies, <laughs> right. Okay, very good. Uh, who else? Former presidents, former first ladies, yes. Heads of state, heads of government when they visit, right? Kings, queens, um, uh, certain prime ministers, presidents. Right? Okay. Um, beyond kings and queens, presidents, and some prime ministers, what other visiting former world figure does the Secret Service protect when they hit U.S. soil? Pope. Yes. Pope. The Pope. Yes, the Pope. Does everybody remember last September? Last September was my perfect storm. We had the General Assembly, 170 world leaders, including the President of China, the President's Prime Ministers of the UK, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Israel, uh, and the Pope, all here at once, in one week, in one place. The Secret Service protected all of them, flawlessly, uh, without incident. Now, okay, final category. Somebody, somebody, um, Somebody said cabinet here. Now, does the Secret Service protect every cabinet officer? No, right? No, you said no. Okay, who does the Secret Service protect in the cabinet? What, 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 it, what is it in this room that might give you a tip off about that? <laughs> uh, me, right? You know, uh, has anybody learned here the concept of race ipsa loquitur in law school? The thing speaks for itself, right? Okay, so the Secretary of Homeland Security, who else? Hmm? Secretary of Treasury, very good. Now the reason is because the Secret Service used to be part of the Treasury Department when they did financial crimes and so forth, and then with the creation of the Department of Homeland Security, the Secret Service moved over to DHS, but the Secretary of Treasury then said, well, don't take away my protection. You can take away the Secret Service, but don't take away my protection. So the Secretary of Treasury still has Secret Service protection. Okay, all right, very good, that's it. Now, there are a lot of people in here who 
contributed to this answer. Um, and you all should see me after this. Um, tell me your name. Cyrus. Cyrus, you got the hardest. You got the hardest part of this. Thank you. Thank you all right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So. The Department of Homeland Security, uh, which I am proud to lead, was created in 2003 by an act of Congress in 2002 in the wake of 9-11. Uh, we are the third largest cabinet department. We have 229, depending on how you count, 229,000 people. You heard we have a budget of 40 billion. Now, it took me a while to learn this. We have a total spending authority of 60 billion. The amount that is appropriated by our Congress this year, FY16, is 41 billion. But then what contributes to our total spending authority is the Disaster Relief Fund, from which FEMA draws money for natural disasters, as well as fees. We collect fees. Customs collects fees. USCIS collects fees. Citizenship and Immigration Services collects fees, naturalization fees, for example. USCIS, for the most part, pays for itself through fees. So we have a total spending authority of 60 billion, 22 components. Our missions are, as you heard, counterterrorism, the enforcement and administration of our immigration laws, cybersecurity, port security, border security, maritime security, detection, of chemical, biological, nuclear threats to the homeland, the protection of our national and visiting leaders through the Secret Service, response to natural disasters, hurricanes, floods, tornadoes. So we have a full plate. We include Customs Border Protection, which is itself the largest federal law enforcement agency of our government, larger than the FBI. We include Immigration Customs Enforcement, Citizenship and Immigration Services, FEMA, the Coast Guard, TSA, and the Secret Service and a number of other directorates and offices. We have an Office of Health Affairs. We have DNDO, as you heard. Um, and all of this was aligned and merged in 2002 by Congress. And all of these different missions used to reside in numerous other agencies, departments of our government, or spread over some 40 different places, all put now under the broad umbrella of Homeland Security. My overarching goal for the department while I'm secretary, and I've been secretary now 27 months and I have 10 left, 305 days, but I am not counting. <laughs> 305 days left, I will leave when Barack Obama leaves. I am very much part of his administration. I was part of his campaign, part of his transition, and I've been part of his administration. But my overarching goal for our department is management reform, to ensure that our department functions more effectively and efficiently for uh, homeland security for the American public. And so we have something called our Unity of Effort Initiative, which I launched two years ago to bring about more effective, centralized decision-making when it comes to budgets, acquisition, and things where it counts that we should act in alignment with each other. Um, our components are very distinct in their culture. A lot of them preceded us, like the Secret Service. But the Secret Service culture is very different from the Coast Guard culture, from, from the FEMA culture, and the immigration component culture. But I want us to work together where it counts. And we've done that in a number of respects. I'm seeking help from Congress this year to do that. But in terms of our individual missions, our counterterrorism mission keeps me up at night very definitely. Uh, we are in a new phase in the global terrorist threat. We have gone from terrorist-directed attacks launched from overseas, recruited from overseas, trained and equipped from overseas, to the prospect of terrorist-inspired attacks on the homeland by people who live here. San Bernardino being the most recent and the most prominent example since 9-11. That has required a whole-of-government approach uh, militarily, we're taking the fight to the Islamic State and to Al-Qaeda overseas. It requires a law enforcement effort by the FBI, but it also requires very much a whole-of-government approach that includes multiple components of homeland security. So we've ramped up and enhanced our presence around federal buildings, 
Uh, we're working a lot more with state and local law enforcement to share what we see by way of intelligence because of the localized nature of terrorist-inspired attacks. I like to say that the cop on the beat could be the next one to discover a terrorist attack on the United States. So it's more important through our grant making and through our intelligence sharing that we work with state and local law enforcement, which we are doing. Um, and one of the things we're doing that is relatively new, that since I've been secretary, we have uh, expanded upon is what we refer to inside the Beltway as our CVE efforts, countering violent extremism, working with communities, mostly American Muslim communities, and I do this myself across the country, uh, to build bridges with American Muslim communities um, and to help them counter the message in their communities of the Islamic State, to counter the appeal of the Islamic State on the internet through social media. We're working with the tech sector to do that. Uh, and some of them have been very good and effective in helping us in that effort. Uh, this year we established grants for communities across the country that are engaging in our CVE efforts. With us, in my view, CVE is as important as any Homeland Security mission. It is a Homeland Security imperative that we enhance and expand upon our CVE mission. I'm pleased that on a bipartisan basis, a lot of people in Congress agree with us. And frankly, the only time that I have gotten myself involved in the political campaign this year, I've been avoiding commenting on some of the things that the candidates for president have said uh, directly. Uh, people ask me, you know, can you build a wall across the entire southwest border? And I said, no, you can't, but I don't directly respond to some of the things that the candidates have said. The one time I did that was when Donald Trump, Donald Trump, I will name him, Donald Trump, um, said we should ban American, we should ban Muslims from entry to this country. The hour he said that, I was at the second largest mosque in this country in Northern Virginia. And it was right after San Bernardino. And I had gone there um, as a show of unity with the American Muslim community that was under siege and has been under siege and under attack. And I had been to this mosque once before. It was one of my best CVE engagements last year. We said the Pledge of Allegiance. There was a Boy Scout troop there, a Girl Scout troop there. And I wanted to go back right after San Bernardino. And I went back. And the very hour I was there at a press conference with the Imam, Donald Trump said what he said. And a reporter asked me, sir, what about what Donald Trump said? And I hadn't heard what Donald Trump said because I was in this engagement when he said it. And I never accept what a reporter says and characterizes as what somebody said. And I said, well, I don't know about that, but it's important that we build bridges and not vilify the American Muslim community. And as I was walking out, somebody said to me, and I could hear it in the side of my ear, but sir, aren't you going to denounce what Donald Trump said? And I thought about that all night and concluded, I had, a, I had an interview with Andrea Mitchell the next day from MSNBC. And I concluded, I have to say something about this because not only is it wrong, it is contrary to our homeland security interest for this suggestion to gain any kind of traction in currency. And so I did comment on it directly that it's crucial that in the current phase we are in, we build bridges to the Muslim communities in this country and not vilify them and drive them into the margins of our society. Um, the immigration issue is, without a doubt, the hardest issue I have worked on in government. And I've worked on a lot of tough issues. Drone strikes, Guantanamo Bay, the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell in 2010 when I was general counsel of DOD. Immigration is a tough issue, without a doubt. A lot of people feel very, very strongly about the immigration issue. 
as they should. And um, people on both sides feel very, very strongly about the immigration issue, as everybody here knows. I'd like to tell audiences that immigration policy must be two sides of the same coin. On the one hand, we want to reckon with, acknowledge the estimated 11 million undocumented in this country. More than half of the undocumented population in this country has been here for more than 10 years. And millions of them have, in effect, become integrated members of society. They go to school with us. They have driver's licenses. They have kids who are US citizens. They have kids who are lawful permanent residents. California Supreme Court says that an undocumented person has a right to practice law in the state of California. They are not going away. So do we insist that they live in a state of ambiguity? Or do we reckon with this population and give them the opportunity to get on the books and be accountable? The President and I want to offer a DACA-like program for adults who have been in this country for five years, who have kids, who are citizens or lawful permanent residents and who pass a background check. That is our DACA program that we announced in November 2014. That program, as I'm sure many of you know, has been in the courts. It started in a district court in Texas uh, and it worked its way through the Fifth Circuit and we're enjoined. But the Supreme Court has agreed to hear the case and they will hear the case on April 18th. I will be on the front row as a member of the bar of the Supreme Court and as one of the defendants. Um, it's Texas versus United States. Some people call it Texas versus Johnson. So I will be there um, to hear the arguments in that case. Now, there's also a border security element to immigration policy and enforcement, and there has to be. We don't have open borders. Central America is filled with poverty and violence right now. We all know about the kids, the families who have left Central America to come here. I know because I have met with literally hundreds of them on the southwest border in South Texas in the Rio Grande Valley. I have encountered a seven-year-old who came here uh, on her own to find her mother. I have encountered a 15 or 16 year old pregnant teenager who was impregnated on the route along the way. I know the, the tragedy and the pain, but we have the obligation to enforce the law consistent with our priorities. Our priorities are public safety and border security. So while the number of deportations in the last several years have gone down dramatically, because I've told our immigration enforcement personnel to focus on the convicted criminals, we have a border security obligation to, to return people after they've gone through the process, they've gone through the litigation process, they've litigated their asylum claims, and they have been ordered deported by a court, and if they are priorities, we have to send them back. Is it pleasant? Absolutely not. Uh, but as long as we have the obligation to enforce the law, we must enforce the law. We can't have open borders. Uh, I know that disappoints many people, but we can't have open borders. Our cybersecurity mission is one where I'm determined to make tangible improvements to our nation's cybersecurity and our federal government's cybersecurity. And our cybersecurity team has done a lot in the last 12 months to get us in a better place. I'll give you two things. We now have at our National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center, the NKIC, where nobody wears a tie. Um, automated real-time information sharing capability with the private sector and with the federal government, where if somebody shares a cyber threat indicator with us, we can share it with other federal agencies and departments and others in the private sector in near real time, if not real time, automated fashion. We didn't have that 18 months ago. We now have this. We also have something called Einstein 3A, 
which has the ability, in addition to Einstein 1 and 2, to block intrusions into federal agencies and departments. My moral of this story, as our nation's cybersecurity guardian, is that far too often cybersecurity starts with students, employees, people who have to guard against spear phishing. And colleges and universities are victims constantly of cyber attacks. I will tell you that as a fact. I am quite sure that is true of this university as well. But the most sophisticated, devastating cyber attacks very often start with a very simple, naive act of spear phishing. Somebody opened the email and the attachment they shouldn't have opened. And so basic cyber education, I hate the phrase cyber hygiene, cyber education can do a lot for cybersecurity. In DHS, what we do is send out a test email, free Washington Redskins tickets, click here, open here. And you open the attachment and it tells you to report to room 401 on Monday for your free Washington Redskins tickets and instead you get a cyber lecture. Uh, but something as simple as that can do a lot for cyber security. I'm, I'm determined when I was the lawyer for DOD, I tried my best not to learn this stuff. I figured others have this. I have forced myself to learn cyber security because we've got to make critical improvements to our nation's cyber security. I'd like to say that our counterterrorism mission is the cornerstone of DHS's mission, cybersecurity is the other cornerstone. And so this is vital to our national interest. I could go on and on to talk about Secret Service, FEMA, everybody loves FEMA. Uh, FEMA is what our federal government does best now. FEMA's come a long way in the last 10 years. Um, since the days of Katrina, FEMA is remarkable for what it does. We're making tangible improvements to aviation security. Many of you here will be familiar with the Inspector General's test of our aviation security capabilities that went public last year. It wasn't supposed to go public. That was a classified report. But like many things in Washington, it leaked. And in the wake of that, I gave our new TSA administrator, I had to replace the existing one, and I gave our new TSA administrator a 10-point plan for improving aviation security, which he has done. I'm sorry that there are longer wait times at airports, in many airports. Um, part of it is simply increased travel volume. 1.8 million people used to come in contact with TSA a day. We're up to 2.2 million. There are more people traveling per day. Well, it's a good thing. Everybody's getting around. The economy's improving. That is a good thing. But we do have longer wait times. I urge all of you who are not already to join TSA PreCheck. Um, short of line. You don't have to take your belt off. You don't have to take your shoes off. You submit to a background check. TSA PreCheck. We signed up something like 1.2 or 1.5 million people in TSA PreCheck. Join now before that short of line gets to be a longer line. Um, but I could go on forever. The last thing I'll say before I take questions is, and I want you to know this, uh, two last things, I, well, one last thing. Um, the nature of Homeland Security is that our good news is no news. The public doesn't hear about all the extraordinary things that go into keeping the homeland safe, that go into protecting the UN General Assembly, that go into our aviation security, that go into the countless number of people that the Coast Guard pulls out of the water every year. Home, good news is no news. Everyone hears about the bad news. Not enough of you hear about the extraordinary efforts of the people who work in DHS to keep you all safe, to keep the homeland safe. Uh, and so I'm on a mission to promote that. Um, I think if more people knew about what our people do on behalf of the American public, um, on behalf of the taxpayer, um, you would be extraordinarily proud and impressed. Um, last week at BWI Airport, 
I put on a TSA uniform. This has gone viral on Twitter. I put on a TSA uniform and worked alongside the TSOs, passing the bins, uh, helping people uh, get through the security, and I walked in their shoes for a couple hours. And that was, maybe, maybe two people said thank you all that time. Uh, so I know what it's like to be a TSO. And obviously, no one's happy when you have to take your laptop out, you gotta take your shoes off, take your belt off, you're delayed, you're slowed down, and trying to get to your gate. No one's happy, but they're there to protect you. And so my message is, we're, we're all working very hard uh, around this country and around this world to protect you. There is no more important mission that our government does on your behalf. And so I'd like to humbly suggest, the next time you see a TSO, or a member of the Coast Guard, or a member of the Border Patrol, or somebody in FEMA at a disaster recovery situation, a flood, please say thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So let me tell you how this is going to work. I'm going to put a question. I'm going to let Juliet Kayem, who's a member of the faculty here and who was an assistant secretary at the Department of Homeland Security, put a question. And we're going to go to the floor. There are microphones here, so you can line up. But uh, Secretary, let me ask you about uh, terrorism and the sizing of the problem. It's a very interesting interview in the current issue of The Atlantic. Uh, with President Obama, yes. in which he says that he thinks that the American view of the threat is disproportionate to the threat. So that the terrorism poses a threat th uh, that's uh, not commensurate with the fear of the threat. And here in particular, it says, Obama frequently reminds his staff, so I don't know if this includes you or not, so I'm not sure which side of this are Probably. you on, uh, that terrorism takes far fewer lives than handguns or car accidents or falls in the bathtub do. He expressed admiration for the <coughs> Israelis' resilience in the face of constant terrorism, and it's clear he'd like to see more resilience <coughs> replace panic in the American society. Nonetheless, as the article points out, his advisors are fighting a constant rearguard action to keep Obama from placing terrorism in what he regards its proper perspective, out of concerns that he'll seem insensitive to the fears of the American people. So tell us about Obama's view versus the fears of the American people and your own view. <clears throat> well, our president, um, I think, wants to assure the American people about their safety. As the Homeland Security guy, <clears throat> I think part of my job is public reassurance as well. The way I like to explain it, <clears throat> particularly in times of anxiety like last fall, November, December, or the fall before that when we were dealing with Ebola, is to explain to the public first, here are all the things we are doing to keep you safe. Here are the 10 things we're doing in Homeland Security, in law enforcement, in national defense to keep you safe. And we are working around the clock, overtime, to keep you safe. Last Thanksgiving, December, and to a large extent still today, the public is, is anxious. And so what I have said and continue to say is we're doing a lot of different things in aviation security, in national security um, to keep you safe. Here are the things, and I want you to know that there are people in law enforcement, homeland security, national security, working overtime to keep you safe this holiday season, this spring. Um, and when you explain it to people that way, I think that they are reassured that their government is working for them, uh, working hard for them. Um, and I think that people understand that in a free and democratic society, in a free and open society where we celebrate the freedom to travel, freedom to associate, privacy, that we cannot eliminate 
and erase all risk, all risk of a public gathering, of a sporting event, of traveling by train or air. You cannot eliminate all risk. But it's incumbent upon us to keep telling the American public all the things we are doing to reduce, if not eliminate, that risk. I could build a perfectly safe air flight for you. I could insist upon a perfectly safe commercial air flight, and I know how to achieve it. You would not be wearing any clothes. You would have no carry-on. You would have no food. You would not be allowed to get up from your seat. You would be miserable. And I don't want you to be miserable, and neither do the airlines. And so it's like what I was saying earlier. Physical security and the things that we enjoy in a free society must be a balance. And my job is achieving that balance. And <clears throat> when you explain it to people, I think they understand it and respect it that way. Thank you. Julie Kayem. Well, I had the pleasure of interviewing Secretary Johnson for uh, uh, my podcast, so that will come out on Wednesday. So I'm going to ask you something I didn't ask you uh -oh. then, which was, are you surprised the extent to which the national, the, the outside of government national security community is very split on the encryption debate? You don't have to talk about, you know, Apple or FBI, but just the extent to which uh, uh, there are people, including your predecessor, Michael Chertoff, and others who do not want to give the government the back door um, capacity to get into these particular phones or networks. And how do you think about, essentially, the standoff that's between <coughs> these companies and the federal government mm. at this stage? Um, yes, I do find that interesting. Um, you would expect people to be essentially in two camps. Um, privacy interest, uh, the tech companies, and government, law enforcement, national security on the other side. And <clears throat> many in national security um, and in the intelligence community have hesitation about a backdoor, about uh, compromises to encryption, and I, I understand that. Um, <clears throat> I think that in response to the demands of the marketplace, um, we've gone very far down the road of ensuring security and privacy in your communications, my communications, my kids' communications, uh, but it has, in fact, made it harder to detect crime. And it has, in fact, made it harder to detect potential terrorist plots. It, it's demonstrable. And as I think the President said the other day, there are very few, there should be in national security, very few unqualified absolutes. And I personally believe that there needs to be a recalibration of these efforts. Again, it's a balance between our liberties, our privacy, um, which we enjoy in so many different contexts, and our law enforcement national security needs. Any crime, not just federal, but state and local, any crime that involves a communication, child pornography, for example, is compromised by encryption. The ability to detect those crimes is compromised by encryption. The Manhattan DA, Cyrus Vance, um, your namesake, uh, the Manhattan DA, Cyrus Vance, uh, has been very outspoken about this, and he's a local law enforcement guy. And so <clears throat> I, don't, I don't know, the, I'm not smart enough to know the solution myself. I do know that if we brought together stakeholders from the tech sector, from privacy, civil liberties communities, from the intelligence community, the law enforcement community, the national security community, and they were all adequately represented in a room with some really smart people, we could figure this out. And I think we will, eventually. So this lady is the first, please. Introduce yourself and a short question. Great, thank you. Thank you, Secretary Johnson. My name is Dominique Gilbert. I'm a master in public policy student here at the Kennedy School. Um, 
I actually have been working at Homeland Security for the past five years, so you don't know this, but you're like my boss's boss's boss. Okay, <laughs> but, all right, um, <laughs> okay. Um, my question for you is how DHS is currently and, and might plan to better engage with the human rights community. Um, I asked you this because in my time here at HKS, I'm, I've been focusing on human rights and I've perceived a distrust between human rights professionals and national security or law enforcement professionals that I think is unnecessary and it's, it's and I think the policies of DHS are very respectful of human rights. You talk about this balance, but I think there's a, like the disconnect between the policies and the practice and I wonder if you could speak to that. Um, in my last job in the Department of Defense and especially in this job, I've spent a lot of time um, with advocates, immigration advocates, human rights advocates, uh, U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, um, AFL-CIO, um, listening to their concerns. I was the first, uh, I spent a lot of time in my last job on college campuses, Stanford, Harvard, Yale, Oxford, talking about the legal architecture for our counterterrorism efforts in this administration. And I think it's important that we do that. Um, and I think it's important that in the homeland security, counterterrorism, encryption, and immigration debates and how we set policy, it's important to get all perspectives. I don't think of myself as ideologically driven. I think of myself as a pragmatic problem solver. Mm -hmm. And to do that, I know that it's important to get all perspectives uh, well informed. We have, we have something unique in DHS. We have an immigration ombudsman <coughs> Uh, whose job it is to corral all the voices of those who don't work for DHS uh, but are interested in immigration reform and fairness in our immigration policies. And I have an Office of Privacy and an Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties that report directly to me. And I have had uh, immigration policy and legal advisors who are voices for the community who report directly to me. And I think it's critical that we do that. When I was writing the Department of Defense report on the risk of repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which prohibited uh, gays from serving openly in the military, I got all perspectives, all of them, believe me. Not just, we went on a listening tour uh, I listened to something like 15,000 members of the military, but I also listened to every single voice in that debate. And everybody had an opinion about don't ask, don't tell. Status quo, repeal, or even go further. And uh, I think it's important to hear all those voices. Uh, one thing that Robert Gates taught me when he was Secretary of Defense and I was his lawyer, if even when you disagree, if people feel like they've been heard and understood, it makes for better and more sustainable policy. So um, <clears throat> because we are the Department of Government that interacts with the public most, and because we are Homeland Security, which means interfacing with the American public, I think it's important that we hear from uh, voices of the people and voices for change, and voices for civil liberties, and voices for privacy. Yeah. The gentleman in the loge, please. Uh, thank you. My name is Jack, and I'm a freshman at the college. There you are. Okay. Yeah, over here. I'd say there's a widely held perception in the American public that the Department of Homeland Security is a reactive organization, that it creates new initiatives in response to events that get headlines and public outrage such as 9-11, which with the massive increase of airport security, or the underwear bomber with the full body scans, mm -hmm. or the cart refugee crisis at the southern border with a sudden rush for funding of de new detention centers. To what extent do you believe this perception is false? Um, well, fair question. Um, I'm quite sure it does appear that we are reactive in nature, and to a very large to a very <coughs> large extent, we are. Uh, we're on defense a lot. 
It's the nature of what we do. We're on defense. And we have to learn and adjust to real world events. If we didn't, then we wouldn't be doing our jobs. Uh, and some real world events are unanticipated real world events. But I, what I preach to our folks is we have to respond to the next terrorist attack and not the last one. So we don't necessarily want to plug the hole at the airport, for example, where there was a breach, but we want to plug that same hole in eight or nine other airports where that same risk may exist. Having said that, there are a whole lot of things that we do sight unseen to the American public to try to anticipate events that actually do prevent events and do plug holes. But again, this goes back to what I was saying before. We don't always hear about those um, because there hasn't been that major real world event that gets the public's attention, that gets the press's attention um, to respond to these things. We spend, we spend millions of dollars a year and we give out in grant money millions of dollars a year for preparedness, for resilience, for natural disaster preparedness, for preparedness to mass shootings, active shootings. I have trained and been to training for active shooter exercises. We did one in the New York City subway system, for example, um, in November that we funded. The NYPD and DHS did an active shooter exercise. We did the same thing two weeks ago in Louisville, Kentucky. I went there. We did the same thing in Miami, Miami-Dade. And these are to anticipate events, real world events. And I know that active shooter training, for example, can do a lot to prevent something really bad from happening. I've seen it myself and I've had people tell me I responded the way I responded because of active shooter training. So there's a whole lot we do to anticipate and not just react to events. Again, the public doesn't always know about it, but it's my job to anticipate what's coming and not just react to the last thing. But thanks for your question. Thank you. Lady of the Lodge, please. Uh, thank you, Secretary Johnson, for being here. I'm Sobia Makbul. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. Uh, in your talk, you uh, mentioned about engaging with communities. I think that's a very important concept. I had the opportunity to take a group of students to Pakistan f uh, during the spring break, and I think I can say with s reasonable degree of assurance that they did not feel threatened by security while they were there. So the perception that we see in media and what the ground reality is, there may be a disconnect between the two. So just going back to your point about engaging with communities, mm -hmm. do you think the US government is doing enough to actually understand what, um, I, I specifically let's say about Pakistan, what the people mm -hmm. are about? Uh, because if this disconnect exists, how does that feed into policy making at the national security level? No, we're not doing enough and uh, we need to do more. Um, there's still a lot of distrust of the federal government in Muslim communities. And notice I'm using it plural because the Muslim communities are not a monolith. I mean, you have Pakistani Americans, you have Somali Americans, you have Syrian Americans who are as different as any two communities in this country. And there's a lot of distrust that exists right now of the federal government in these communities. Uh, there are actually CCVE efforts, efforts to counter our countering violent extremism efforts. That's how I know I'm having an impact. And <clears throat> so we need to do more to build bridges. I think we need more grant funding. I think we need more uh, counter messaging, which is not necessarily a government function. And um, my personal goal while I'm in office is to visit every major metropolitan area with a significant Muslim community in it, and I'm, I'm on the way there now. Um, and I think we need to do more, and I hope that my successor continues on this path, and I hope the next administration continues on this path. So, thank you. Thank you. So unfortunately, this needs to be the last question, so this gentleman. Okay. Um, it's actually related to what we just mentioned. Hello, my name's Omar. I'm a student at the college, and I want to thank you for being here. Um, I want to thank you for allowing me to fail so publicly in front of everyone <laughs> on that question. <laughs> you were close. You know what? 70% um, 
of accomplishment is trying, <laughs> raising your hand. If you don't raise your hand, then you never achieve. You never get the challenge coin. Uh, you don't even raise your hand, right? Uh, <laughs> so, um, and I, like last I said, see me after. Okay, yeah. sounds okay. good. All right. I also wanted to, more importantly, thank you for standing with the Muslim community so publicly um, after the comments were made by um, uh, candidate Trump. Um, as a member of the American Muslim community, um, I've been hearing a lot about the CVE efforts. Um, I'm a greater Boston native, and I know Boston is one of the pilot cities for your CVE program. Um, I'd hope that people here would take a second to understand why it seems so discomforting that um, a community, a faith community, a minority in America, uh, might be seen to be singled out on this issue um, <coughs> on extremism where, you know, uh, Constantly, the FBI would say that you know white militant groups, white militias, are actually the most dangerous groups in America at the moment. They present the most, the biggest threat to American interests here domestically. And so, um, when we hear extremism, which is a general term, but then we see, okay, you know, this is only being done in mosques. This is only in response to say radical Islamic extremism. It seems that it's, um, it would seem clear why Muslim Americans are un unnerved by it because it seems to be singling out a community where in fact extremism is a broad American issue. And so on this initiative specifically, do you, do you seem to see that concern and, and how can we yes. begin to fix <coughs> it? Um, I hear it all the time, yes. Yeah. Our CVE mission uh, is generic. Now, the nature of the challenge is that we have the threat presented by the Islamic State, 